Now on RT Radio 1, it's time for the Radio 1 Music Collection. And to mark the centenary this year of the birth in 1908 of the famous travelling Illin Piper Johnny Doran, we're broadcasting the first of two documentary programmes on his life and music, first heard in the Long Note series in 1988. The presenter is Jackie Small. Johnny Doran, a famous piper. The words inscribed on a gravestone in Rath's New Cemetery in County Wicklow. The grave of the best known travelling piper of this century. A man whose vibrant music and gentle personality captured the hearts of the people of rural Ireland in the 1930s and 40s. Fortunately for the history of traditional music, one vital set of recordings captured the music of Johnny Doran. These recordings were made by Kevin Danaher of the Irish Folklore Commission shortly before a tragic accident in January 1948 which crippled Johnny Doran and led to his death two years later at the age of 42. These unique recordings are some of the most influential in the history of the Ellen Pipes. In these two programmes we hope to look at the life and music of Johnny Dorn through the memories of those who knew him and the thoughts of those who have made a special study of his music. One of Johnny's closest friends in Dublin was the West Clare fiddle player John Kelly, who was instrumental in arranging for the recordings of Johnny to be made in the early winter of 1947. He was to visit our shop on Cable Street and the missus and himself being Wicklow people, they were very close to each other, you see, and she used to make great tea and Johnny loved homemade bread and tea. And every night, every night he could, he came, you see. But this night, I know it was in about the month of November, and he was very crestfallen looking. And I'm very bad, he says to me, he left his pipes down on the floor. He said, I have a pain under my heart, he said. And, oh, God, that's terrible, said I. And, ah, oh, shit, it'll be all right, he says, anyway, but... The missus came down then and I said, you know what, so that are quite th- I think Johnny Dorn is going to die. We'd better get him recorded. And I knew Kevin Danner of the <coughs> Folklore Commission. And I walked over to the phone and in my way over to the phone, I had not had a feeling that Danner would be where he'd collect music and things like that, you know, and he'd be way down the country. But just slipped to the phone and called up and the, 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 he rang on the other side and there was a Danner. I told him I had Johnny Dorn in the house and I'd like to get him recorded that he wouldn't feel so well. So, what case he brought him over immediately? It was on a Saturday evening, late Saturday afternoon, in Earlsford Terrace, University College Earlsford Terrace, because at that time the Folklore Commission was working in two or three small rooms at the top there. And they came up there with this very pleasant small man with a bag under his arm containing his pipes I rigged up the thing and he tuned up his pipes and started to play and we made a a certain number of recordings then Uh, and they were the only recordings as far as I know which were ever made from Johnny Doran But later in that particularly bleak winter, on the 30th of January 1948, tragedy struck Johnny Dorn. On a Friday morning then, he was lacing his shoe above him high street and he just had his foot lift up in a chair and the wind blew the top of the wall down this caravan and a half a ton of stones came down and broke the top of the caravan and broke his back. So it was as tight as that. He never played the pipes after that again.
Johnny Doran was born in 1908 into a family with a long association with travelling, horse dealing and playing the ill in pipes. His family background was outlined for us by a near relative, Mrs Margaret Cash. Johnny's father, we say, was John Doran and his mother was a Kathleen McCann Ratnew. They were really Ratnew people. He was a labour man, just a labour man. Yeah, he didn't deal much in horses, John Doran. Yeah. He lived mostly like in Ratnow and then he went to England and he came back and they were living in Dublin. They lived there, he said, before you go up to the market, you know what, the comb I call it. They lived there. I think that's where he died, John Dorn and his wife, Kate. And they're buried in Ratnow. They're buried in Trinity. I'll say the Ratnow. Johnny Doran's family background included a firm connection with the Cash family who had a long and well-documented tradition of virtuoso ill and piping in County Wexford. John Dorn's mother was a Cash, Maggie Cash. His uh, grandfather was John Cash, the world's best piper. John Cash was a colourful figure and one of the best-known pipers of the 19th century. He was a prosperous horse dealer, who, according to the collector Francis O'Neill, each year travelled to the west of Ireland and imported six or seven score of Connemara ponies to South Leinster. John Cash's son, James, Johnny Doran's granduncle, was described as the star piper of the whole globe. The piping tradition in the Cash family continued on into the next generation, and Johnny Doran credited an older relative, John Cash, with having taught him the pipes. Johnny was one of a family of nine. Margaret Doran, there was Mary Doran, there was Ellen Doran, and there was Anne Doran, and Barbara Doran. They was all sisters. They was all John Dorn's family. And then there was Jim Dorn, Felix Dorn, and uh, Johnny Dorn, and Patrick Dorn. That's the, the only one that was alive again. There's left of them. There's only one brother. And there's no sister left. The Dorn family was settled in Rathnew during Johnny's youth, and the children were educated there. Oh, they were. They got school in. I'm sure they did, but I wouldn't know about their school. But they were in Ratno for years anyway, as far as I know. So anyway, but show me all that I learned that, you know. The cash piping tradition of County Wexford lived on into Johnny's immediate family. John Dorn himself played the pipes. Old John, that's Johnny's father. They learned, he learned the two sons. Because John Dorn, old Mr. Dorn, the old John Dorn's mother was a cash. So famous John Cash's daughter. See, that's how he got it. So, so Johnny learned from his father? He learned from his father, yes. In later years, after Johnny Doran's father had introduced him to County Clare, that county became one of Johnny's favourite stamping grounds. Martin Rochford, the piper and fiddler from Bodike, near Fecal in East Clare, remembered Johnny first being brought around that area. His father brought him up to this pub. Father was down early on the day for messages at this place called the Black Sticks, this spoke, and there was a man there very fond of music, John Murphy. He was a shoemaker there, and he was after buying a gramophone, the one the first type came to one of the horn, and he had records. Michael Grogan was the, the accordion player, and the record, Hand Me Down the Tackle, and some of those reels. And so Johnny's father said it that he had a young fellow playing the pipes that he'd bring him down the night when he arrived down at him that night and he played there. They needn't appear again until 1937. The next time Martin saw Johnny Doran, Johnny was married and pursuing the life of a travelling piper, living in a horse-drawn caravan with his family and his pipes, playing in the open air to the people who assembled at fairs, race meetings and hurling and football matches. Kilkishan was the first place he appeared, camped over here and I used to call it the Victor Farm, Travellers of Chitain and near Tom Granny.
So this is where Johnny used to park his yeah, caravan, see, Martin. Yeah, along there. Where are we here? At Kilgory Road, they call it. County Clare, sure. So Johnny, Johnny would park along and here? He'd park there, yeah. How long would he leave the caravan here for? Oh, a couple of days or whatever it'd be offering, you know, whatever he'd be hitting on for again for the fair or whatever it'd be coming on. And how do you travel around to, to play his music? The bike. A racing bike. Pipe box across the handles, whatever way used to, and the two drooped handles, you know, whatever way used to manage it on it. I think across the two, below it, but the handles are drooped. To put it across that way somewhere. And what would we do the horses while they were here? Whatever they did, they had along the road there, sure. And the horses are plenty. Would you have a hooli in the caravan here at night or anything? No, not no. Wait a just did play a few tunes for any person came in or thing that's Did he play a few tunes here? He did often. It was here he came first and he came down there to the to the shop. The, and he young fellow that the father brought him down to see if there was. In this road. The shop is down there. It's down there below. The black sticks. Well, that's the place now. In the Galway area, one of Johnny Doran's most devoted followers was Paddy Philbin, a well-known dancer and dancing teacher. Paddy told us how he first encountered Johnny. I was teaching dancing in my Cullen old parish hall. I used to always cycle there. But this evening I was going to teach my class in my Cullen. When I came <coughs> to this caravan, horse-drawn caravan, I heard this lovely music, Piper. And I got off my bicycle and I went up the two, three little steps. And there was Johnny Doran. I was so delighted to hear the music. And his brother there was one side of him, and he learning his brother, Felix which was a young boy at the time, learning him. He was playing a chanter. Felix was in the corner and Johnny was facing the door. There was two doors in it, half door and a top door. And Johnny was looking out now towards Galway, as the way they had their caravan, just at the head of Ponaclough Road. Did you dance a step for them that first time? No, I did not. No, because you know what it is. I was so confounded with the music. After this first meeting, it became a regular occurrence for Paddy to accompany Johnny Doran's outdoor music routine during his visits to Galway. The first time that I danced for Johnny Doran and Felix Dolan, open air to the whole country, which there were many, was right opposite the Imperial Hotel Galway. Well, that first time, what, what year was that, Paddy? 1934. What day of the week was that? Saturday always, Saturday evening. Saturday evening, every Saturday evening. Maybe there would be an evening that he'd be after coming from Ballad Row, Braces or anything like that, that he'd go there of a Tuesday or a Wednesday evening. But we'd be there always to meet him and welcome him. He was such a great traditional player for Irish dancers. But was he a good player to dance to? Had he good One rhythm in that? One of the greatest players, both rhythm, time and style. Rhythm, time and style. His style of playing was second to none.
Johnny Doran's recording of the reel, The Steam Packet. Johnny's travels followed a kind of sporting calendar around Ireland. In Wexford, near the home of his forebears, the Cash family, his visits were remembered by Nick Kinsella of Bowley's Cross near Kilmore. I remember one time, it was in the late 30s, I went to a horse racing meeting at Linkstown, just a couple of miles from here, and during the day this music struck up anyway, and it was Johnny Dorn with the pipes. And he stood up playing the pipes, which was unusual, I suppose, maybe it was his way of doing it, but he just he just laid his one foot on the case of the pipes and he stood in in a standing position and he played the pipes and he seemed to be very much at his ease. He was a young fellow at the time, young slight lad, and he seemed to be very much uh, at his ears playing and uh, no trouble in the world. And then later on that year, I heard him again at an athletic sports meeting at Kilmore K. And of course he had all the music fans around him as the piper was very, was very rare in this area and everyone wanted to hear him. But it was in County Clare that Johnny Doran found his most loyal following. In this county, he demonstrated his marvellous ability to inspire young musicians to devote their musical lives to the art of piping, to which he introduced them. Willie Clancy, from Milton Malbay, was later to become one of the best-known pipers of our day. He was a young flute player when he was introduced to the pipes by Johnny Doran. Willie's constant companion at that time was his friend Martin Talty, and Martin told us how they first heard Johnny play. It was a, a, an open race meeting here, and uh, we were up the street there, and uh, we just chased down and we held the pipes, you know. Now, while we had heard pipes before that, we'd never seen a, a set of pipes, you know. And we just ran down, and there was Johnny standing just up the street, and uh, uh, a doorway there, and he playing, and I, I even remember the tune he was playing, it was uh, Tar Bolton. Legato and staccato, he opened it up and then the next thing is it twitted out like cocks out of the bottle, you know, the staccato. And uh, tapped away on the regulators as he felt like, you know. It's fantastic music, really. That was the real Tar Bolton, played by Johnny Doran on the pipes, accompanied on the fiddle by John Kelly. Another West Clare fiddler to encounter Johnny at the race meeting in Milton Malbay was Junior Crean. Ah, the Milton race was the big day here, and it was the races Johnny arrived first, and back in the Central they had the races, and and we had the pipes playing, so we made for the piper. And Penny is that time, and Tuppence. But if we give him sixpence, he'd do the round and he'd come back again. What would you like me to play now? He'd say, give out the value of fuel money. <laughs> and money was scarce. But he got 13 pounds in coppers at the race course. <laughs> and he went into a pub in to change it. And the woman was delighted to get all the chance. We got to know him then straight away, you know. And then in the evening about this time, we got on a flat pony car he had, you know, what they call, travelling people call it a flat. Um, and we just sat up in it, you know, and his wife was with him and we went out to, just beyond Quilty there, there's a ford and a railway bridge just to cross the road there and he had a caravan under the railway bridge for shelter, you know. So we stayed there most of the night and played and things like that, you know. 
Margaret Cash was about the same age as Johnny Doran. Oh, I knew Johnny had grown up, definite. He was a very nice chap, yeah. Very nice fella. Very thin spared, dark. And a nab going fella. He wouldn't play for any when he'd like himself. But Felix was different. He was an all round man, Felix. He played for anybody. Johnny was uh, something, you know. He was a very funny going fella, you know. He didn't mix in with much. Much of his own people. Now he always kept to himself. You know, he was that class. He kept in more with the the farming type and the piping people, the musicians. That's the way I'm saying it. He didn't play, you know, much for the. He had to coax and play a tune for you. He wanted to like you very much before he played for you. Johnny's visits to his relatives in Carlow Town were remembered vividly by his first cousin, Frank O'Brien. I was a kid then, you know, when he came around to our house and stayed with number five, stayed with Road in the old house. That time our house was a great place for a gathering and uh, not for so much for music, but uh, we were, I suppose, closer to him than anybody else. And he always called to us when he came around, you know. And he was a very popular man, very popular with the, our neighbours and generally in Carlow because he played in Carlow and played everywhere with the pipes. But um, when Johnny had come, like he'd, uh, he'd be more than welcome. He'd be, be like Christmas when he'd come because there was no television that time. The only thing we had was the old gramophone, table gramophone that you do, which, you know, you wind up on that, you know. And uh, that's the only thing. I don't believe we, we had a radio at that time. There was no radio, no television. So any um, live music like that was more than welcome. But this was Christmas to see him coming because he was very popular. And pipes, you know, no one could play the pipes. He could play them. And he was a master of them. But uh, I can remember the open fireplace and the lights on and we all sitting around on the floor or anywhere we could sit where we could get a seat here and play. There'd be plenty of people out in the streets. And he'd 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 be in for the for the night when he'd call there and of course the the bacon and cabbage would be on and the apple tarts and that time we had a sister who was a great cook, like she was a great cook, and uh, of course she was always welcome there. And we 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 wouldn't let him go to bed or anything late late at night, you know, when we were playing the pipes, even playing and this, that, and all, you know, all the different tunes we all fancied, you know. But he was very popular anyway, like you know, even if we never played the pipes. Johnny Doran playing the set dance, The Blackbird. In County Cavan, Tommy Donoghue remembered Johnny's visits to his own area around Baker's Bridge near the Fermanagh border. Alien pipes at that never was played in the County Cavan much that ever I went. Johnny used to come to Baker's Bridge every year, religiously every year around the one time. Said for the missus and I suppose the children, they were all small children at that. I suppose finished school myself, but we used to love to see Johnny coming for to hear him. We'd sit all night talking to him. And him playing for us, and he'd play away with the young man, that him. And uh, it was surely lovely for to listen to him, and we'd put every little bit of timber together. There was an old fellow named name of Leddy. He'd be a friend of Eugene Leddy, you know, Eugene the band man, the fiddle player. He'd be a friend of his, and he was a great step dancer. And Johnny Dorton would play for him. I didn't see him again then until about out of 1938, he seemed to hang a lot around here in 38. He played at a wedding over here. A man named John Meany. He met him at the fair at Scarif. That was June 1938, this wedding. He played there. 
and I had a big day. I went to Robert, but not met him in the evening. I went to my office in Bodaik and I got the pints. And they brought me up to the wagon and he wrote a tune for me, the swallow's tail. He used to make a grand job of it. Martin Rochford here, playing the version he learned from Johnny Dorn of the reel The Swallow's Tale. Fifteenth of June, then there was a fair and tall and a crowd organised to get a half barrel of stout to bring it to an old house that's up here. And we had a big night, night and morning that night. And uh, there was a man there, Paddy Paul, I said, and he was a music teacher. And spent a lot of time in America. But we were cursing. Paddy Paul because he had him head up playing a lot of what we wanted here, Johnny playing reels and he had him playing this set dance of the three sea captains and all this business. So he knew all those students in America. And we settled eight o'clock in the morning. Johnny had the wagon cap and Neil pulled in near it. The most northerly point we know on Johnny Doran's travelling calendar was the seaside resort of Bundoran in County Donegal. Tommy Hunt from near Ballymote in County Sligo, remembered a visit there with his brother Michael and a friend Dick O'Byrne, the son of the Sligo fiddle master Philip O'Byrne, who had been one of the teachers of the great Sligo American fiddler Michael Coleman. Dick O'Byrne, uh, he was with uh, his elder brother down to Bundorn. And Do Dorn was down on a lane where that went from the main street down to the shore, from the beach, and he was playing his pipes down, down there. And Byrne was terribly interested when he saw him on ears. And didn't uh, Byrne walk over to him? He said, Will you play the high, high level horn pipe? Uh, I will, says Johnny, do it with the can. Turn around and play the high level horn pipe early, doing a job, and that was something worth listening to. And when he had finished and all, Byrne put his hand down his pocket, he had one half a crown, that's the old money, to one such. And uh, he gave him the half a crown. He was as proud of having the half a crown to give him as if he had a hundred pound left. <laughs> but uh, he was when he, when, he, when he was pleasing to 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 Bern as a as a musician, he had to be good because Bern knew everything about it himself and could play it. Johnny Dorn with the high-level hornpipe. In County Mayo, a visit from Johnny Dorn was remembered by accordion player Johnny Cleary, who spoke to us on his farm in Castlegar near Clare Morris. As far as I can say, it will be about 1935 or six. He came like this evening, and he left tomorrow evening. He had a, a caravan, and a horse-drawn caravan, and he, there was a, a fair then in Crochimar, and he had his bicycle on the caravan and he took his pipes with him and went to the fair and played around the streets, you know. He landed in the evening here and put up his caravan <coughs> and he came down to the house that night. And like it was like a kind of a visiting house, you know, and there was a crowd of them and he played and uh, they gave him a, made a bit of a collection, you know. Sixpence was a lot at that time, you know. So he got his about six or seven shillings, you know, which was a good amount of money, like at the time. I suppose that was the way he had for making his living, you know. I remember we went to Killer's Races one time with a, a Piper's band that was here, you know, they were selling tickets or something like that. 
But there wasn't any question of accommodation. There was a second day's meeting the following day, you know. So we then I went out to the wagon with Johnny, you know. And we slept in the in the wagon that night with himself and the family, you know. And the following morning, things weren't too prosperous around here that day. The following morning, we got up and out to stream and had a nice wash, you know, all that. And uh, when we came back, the wife had uh, rashers and eggs and all this sort of thing cooked for things we wouldn't have at home at the time, you know. Uh, the following day, after this night we slept on him, we went out to Kilkee with him. And uh, we started to play, I think there's two flutes on the pipes in the street, you know, and people were pitching in the half crowns. And eventually, uh, Willie left down the flute and he danced a hornpipe on the, on the footpatch, you know, Johnny playing, and I took up the bag and went along collecting. And uh, oh, we had wonderful times, you know. I was amazed at all the money that was being thrown in, you know. Would you play in the street for money now around here in Fakel or in... Oh, you, oh yeah. Turner. Yeah, Turner. How would he look Fair like that when he... Fakel. in Fakel. Mm. Yeah, that was a that big day with him. To wear his grey pants and sports coat and... Usually a pair of sandals. Summer time, he would be around. Would he stand up or sit down when he was playing? Standing up with his foot on the box. And he had a gadget soldered onto the base throw that he used to hit the valve again to close it. And I've made a strap around it to keep it up, to keep up the pipes. He wouldn't be closing that on his knee. He'd give it a tip again that so into the chamber. Very loud. Would you play very loud? No. Oh no. Very sweet. He told me he never liked sharp pipes. And it was interesting to see, you know, he used to drop a box or a bag in the in the street, you know, and that time normally what you give is a penny to a musician or anything like that, but there were half crowns and two shillings and all flying in. The whole people became elated with this kind of music, you know, they hadn't heard music of that standard now for a long time before, you know, they hadn't heard the pipes at all, most of them. I didn't see Johnny then for a long time, I saw him up beside Trustoni Railway Station and <coughs> I brought him and I told him to go to Clonus to an Ulster final and he did and he says why did Clonus he was going towards uh, you'd be met up with the northern boys so they threw him nothing nor less nor two shillings and a half crown and Johnny was made up that had been now around 1943 or there and I think something happened to his caravan about Chin and leg, and there was a great man there, he was a Dr. Plunker. God be good to him, he's dead. He had a great set of pipes, and he gave them to Johnny. At least he told me that, now that that was that's the set of pipes he had at that, um, that he was playing in Clonus, belonged to Dr. Plunker. He was always looking for shelter with the wagon. It was a square top wagon. You know, the, not this barrel top at all that you'll see with travellers. So it was a big square old thing. And, I used to, if I was up the hill, I'd not come and you know, view over there for two miles from our field, and you'd see the wagon coming. I'd know to Johnny with the swear top. Sean Reed, the last time he came here with me when I was up there, I was in Oaks for the man. And Johnny Dorney said, I was in Mount Callan. Go home, I said, I know, man, off we go, and the old man was cursing all around him. Try to go. <laughs> and we went on there, and Johnny was inside it. I was named Corrie's. And Mount Kellen. And uh, the man of the house there had a set of pipes. Flat, nice flat set, but 
Johnny tuned it up and we had a great evening. And that was the first evening you see Sean Reed's pipes. Johnny played those as well. well what'll bring him around this area, Matt? He used to travel a lot of West Clare. He used to come by Balneslow always. At Lone Balneslow, that's the road he used to come. He used to play along Balneslow and the hash crown. All that part of the county Garla. He'd come on then here and he'd kill a dice, it was a very fit favourite haunt of his. He used to go that way and work his way back by Kildush, back into Milltown. Races in Kilkee always, he'd play there. And around Milltown in Mount Callan. He used to stay around there in a lot, place called Crow's Bridge, around there. On his return journey to the east coast, after his travels in the west of Ireland, Johnny Dorn's route took him through the village of Kill, County Kildare, where he visited fiddle player Liam O'Flynn, the father of the well-known present-day piper. Uh, one day, uh, a visitor came here, very surprised when this man came to the door, and he said, uh, my name is Dorn, Johnny Dorn, I'm a piper. And of course I knew of him and heard of him, and heard him playing in places before, but I never actually met him. He told me that uh, he had been in, in Newbridge and my friend, my very good friend, Sergeant Tom Armstrong, in the barracks there in Newbridge, the guards barracks, told him if he was coming this way to call in to me and, and uh, we could have some tunes together, some music. So Johnny came in and we had a few tunes together. Johnny was a marvellous piper, one of the best ever. Yes, we played together for a few tunes. He played tunes that I never heard and I... I used to try to keep up with him, of course, which I wasn't able to do. He had a, he had a wonderful style, and uh, he had a great collection of tunes. He played tunes that, uh, that I really never heard before. Did he stay in the locality for long? I know, no, he was passing through, you know, passing through. But he'd, he'd go around to race meetings, and one day <laughs> when we were at Punchestone races, I heard the pipes and... Of course, I went across to see who was it, and there it was, Johnny Dorden playing away there. Quite a crowd around him. Did he have any tunes with Sergeant Armstrong? Oh, yes, they used to play quite a bit together. They did, yes, in, in Newbridge, in the, in the barracks there. Frank O'Brien remembered one of Johnny Dorn's visits to a horse fair in Tinnehealy, County Wicklow. He was in a caravan there. He was only parked there for a few days. There was a fair on then, the, the Tinnehady Fair, was it? Three months, isn't it? Three months. Yes, three months. It's a three months fair. Quarterly fair. Quarterly fair. That time was a fair, big gather of anybody like that, travellers. <coughs> came to Tinnehady, you know. A lot came from the north to buy horses there and that. He came from everywhere, from Wexford. Might be one or two from England, buy horses, but mainly a lot from the north. And wherever there's a big gathering like that, Johnny would be there, you know. Had he any interest besides the music, Martin? Was he interested in doing a bit of fishing or anything like that? No, not, not a lot. He used to shoot rabbits, uh, an old shotgun. And rabbits belonged the road there, a place full of rabbits that time. He had two horses. And he had a powerful, powerful mare there, and only for that you shouldn't be able to, you'd be able to get that old wagon over the hills up, kill a dice up to north through his clear. Trouble pulling that old thing he had. Ever do any horse dealing or anything? No. Felix did that. I saw Felix often had a deal, but Johnny had What kind of a man was Johnny? What did he look like? Thin, hard day. Nice. Just a small wood binds. Drinking that Very point. nice. Not, not much. He'd, about two pints a day would be his. He'd be always back at the wagon at eight o'clock. Could set the clock for him back. And he used to play a flat set of pipes in the wagon. Very nice, he had three or four sets of pipes. Johnny would be, I think he was small, you know, about five feet six. A nice looking lad, very prominent white teeth. And the first thing I noticed was extremely long flat fingers, you know. Um, that's the thing I know too, you know, Seamus says his fingers are extra long. They aren't as wide or as flat as Johnny's were, you know. But uh, he had ex an extremely long fingers, but he was a small, quiet man, you know. Married at the time? Yes, he was, and they had kids. I think it was five. I think they finished up with seven altogether, but that I knew of anyway. 
Johnny Doran's gentle and agreeable character made a strong impression everywhere he went. I never heard him say a rude word to anybody. I never saw him attempt to fight or do anything like that. And uh, generally speaking, he was a very pleasant man with the wife and kids and all that, you know. In the Ireland of the 1930s and 40s, at a time when to have a gramophone or a radio was an impossible luxury for many followers of music, Johnny Dorn and his pipes brought happiness into the lives of countless numbers of people. In our second programme, we continue with a detailed look at his music and the events that led to his untimely death. We'd like to leave you, as we began this programme, with Johnny's marvellously fluent playing of the piping reel, Colonel Fraser. program was presented by Jackie Small and produced by Harry Bradshaw. It was first transmitted on the 28th of March 1988 in the Long Note series. The recordings of Johnny Doran's music were reproduced with the permission of the UCD Delargy Centre for Irish Folklore and the National Folklore Collection. And the second documentary on Johnny Doran's life can be heard on the Radio 1 Music Collection next week. Time now for the Radio 1 Music Collection. To mark the centenary this year of the birth in 1908 of the famous travelling Illan Piper Johnny Doran, we're broadcasting the second of two documentary programmes on his life and music. First heard in the Long Note series in 1988, the presenter is Jackie Small. In our first program on the life and music of the great travelling piper Johnny Doran, we saw how he became established during the 1930s as a welcome visitor to sporting and other outdoor events all over Ireland through his supreme virtuosity on the pipes. With all respect to Ennis and to Rawson and to Willie Clancy and to the other great pipers, there was something about Doran's piping which was absolutely unique. places where Johnny Doran played, people had never seen Illan Pipes before. Martin Rochford in East Clare remembered his reaction. It was love at first sight when I, when I helped him to the pipes. Did he help you to get pipes? Oh, indeed, he got to practice sitting in this one, yeah. I remember my name, Dan McMahon, 76 A. Pamela Street. I think it was only two pounds or something like that. Who found a lot of money that time. Anybody else besides yourself who, who was inspired to play by Johnny? Martin? Not on this side of the country. There was no piper. Any pipers that came after uh, inspired me was West Clare. There was a few there in West Clare. Near Clare Morris in County Mayo, Johnny Cleary remembered Johnny Dorn's piping and another facet of his musical talents. Well, I know he made an awful impression me any, on me anyhow, because I thought I never had anything like him to play. He could do anything with him pipes. And he was a grand little fella, as far as I can remember now. He wasn't too big and well-dressed. You wouldn't think he was a nice of the road anyhow, you know. He was a respectable kind of a fella and 
grand company, and he was a fantastic step dancer. I, at that time now, in the old times, you'd see the, the old people dancing hard and pipes, you know, and they used to dance them very fast. But he used to dance it slow on this treble, you know. It was the first time ever I saw it. And he was real, I thought he was fantastic. He asked me, would I play, could I play a Dunfus hornpipe and play it at a very slow time? So I managed it all right for him. <coughs> I tell you, he was knocking dust out of the floor. Martin Talty from Milton Malbay remembered Johnny Dorn's knowledge of the craft of tinsmithing, which was traditional among travellers. Johnny was well versed in making components for his pipes. Uh, he was a tremendously skillful man with his hands then as well, you know. I distinctly remember making uh, keys and things like that and using the iron band in the wagon wheel as a anvil, you know. And he'd be tapping it, you know, with the hammer gently like that, you see, shaping it, you see. And he'd turn over and talk to you and he wouldn't be looking at what he'd be, he'd still be tapping, you know. One day I met him. It was a good many years before he had the accident. It was out in Fortune's town, outside of Tala. He was fixing his pipes and I was interested looking at what he was doing. He told me he was making keys with silver spoons, the top of silver, the white part of it, the old fashioned tea spoons then years. But they were really silver. And he was making reeds out of a bit of cane. And he was blowing them. That's what I was interested in. He was blowing them to see would the sound come through and were genuine for his pipes. He used to tr do all his own work with his pipes. And he would go around with him, he was able to do them. And I think also he used to do Felix's. Mrs. Margaret Cash, a near relative of Johnny Doran. The beginning of World War II, with its restrictions on food supplies, saw a curtailment of Johnny's travels. 1940, then was about the last time I see him around. He never came around. Felix came in 39. Haven't seen Johnny after that then. He came once in 1940. That's all I ever see him after. Johnny Doran's travels near the Six County border during this period of war rationing brought him the odd business opportunity, which occasionally came into conflict with the letter of the law. The only uh, thing I know about that was illegal was he did a little bit of smuggling during the war, some tea from across the border. Uh, he was caught, I think, once, at least that I know of, and uh, fined, and he paid the fine. That was end of story. It was a suitable thing, you know, because he wasn't didn't have to drag the family onto the road or anything like that. He had a false bottom in the wagon, like, you know, and he used to cross the border and nine times out of ten you get away with it, you see. Tommy Donohue in Baker's Bridge near the Fermanagh border remembered that one time in ten when Johnny, in fact, didn't get away with it. But at this Sunday evening, the guards came for to take Johnny. So everyone stood up on the road and told the sergeants he wouldn't take him if he didn't go back to places where he comes from and he'd be through in the river. And he went back. He comes from the next morning. But he got him on after I think that that time he took Johnny for smuggling. Job of Journey Work, played by Johnny Doran, one of the unique set of recordings of his music made by the Irish Folklore Commission in 1947. The foremost authority on Ilan piping in recent times was the collector of traditional music, the late Brendan Branagh. I heard Johnny myself. I only met him only once, he's playing in our square. And, uh, but my remembrance of him, or my idea of his, of his playing, is solely related to the tapes, of course. And um, there, 
of course, you, you immediately think of Rakish Paddy and Colonel Fraser before them, I mean, obviously in America, wherever they are, anyway. And the impression, I guess, is the there's a tremendous exuberance or exhilaration in his music. Uh, there's a, a kind of an onward rush that ignores the little minor blemishes. Because if you do replay the music by mechanical means, of course, now, you hear it the second time, you hear it the third time, and you do become aware of small little wee things. But they are lost in, in the tremendous rush of music and the virtuosity, you might say, of the whole thing. But what was the original model for Johnny Doran's artistry on the Illand Pipes? I'd say that it comes from the Wexford Pipers, such as Johnny Cash and those. And uh, it was a style that Cash and those had in Wexford. There were two schools of thought in Wexford, I think, at the time. One was the open plane, which Tom Rowson of those did. And the other was uh, this tight thing, you know, which is common to itinerants anyway. Used to improvise a lot. He used, he used, and if you played a tune and played it well, you know, he'd always, he had a habit of saying, uh, I want to help this up in County Longford, and this is the way it went, and then he'd show you something, you know. He'd really go to town on it. But I have been told since, years afterwards, that in Longford, he'd say, I heard this down the County Clare, you know. <laughs> but it, it was really his own uh, performance, you know. It's obvious, of course, that he must have been at the, the pipes when he was even a, a child, you know, having a go at them, as it were, like. So with the time that he was mature, that he had a kind of total mastery of the chapter and of the regulators and that, the the, the music appears to respond immediately to the, the fingers. And on the regulators and that, there's a, a tremendous variety of rhythmical ornamentation right through the whole thing. Um, it's not surprising that it, it does have an effect on, on people like and they, that they immediately succumb, as it were, to the style. The composer, Shosha Bodley, who is Professor of Music at University College Dublin, has taken a keen interest in the music of Johnny Doran and has lectured on aspects of his technique. What was his first reaction on hearing Johnny play? Well, I, I was really very impressed. I, I remember it, it was Brandon Brannock, in fact, who introduced me to some uh, recordings he had of Johnny Doran playing. And I, I must say, I, I was very impressed with this open-fingered, free-flowing legato that he does, you know, uh, with occasional bits of, of tight playing. But also, too, with things like the way he, he handles these this double and treble rolling, you know, where he'll take an open roll at successively three times. It's really, really very interesting. But I noticed, for instance, that in the in the reels you have this quite off this flowing series of triplets that just flow up and down in the, in the easiest way. And I think it's it's the most striking aspect of his playing in many ways, is this sense of, of urgency forward. It just flows along like a stream. I think too as well, he was a, a kind of a very a piper of great integrity in the sense that he was consistent and one doesn't have the feeling of, of borrowing so to speak uh, I one thing that I think is particularly interesting is the way this flowing chanter work is set off very often against the regulator rhythms so that uh, he has perhaps uh, a very flowing line on the on the chanter and then a couple of uh, quite hard staccato chords backing this up and uh, that's, that's something that I thought was, was particularly effective and, and nice in any event I certainly found it, found it you know, the speed and the ease of it it's rather like a waterfall you know it's, it's really quite fascinating to listen to Thank you. 
Martin Rochford spent a great deal of time with Johnny, learning to play from him and studying his way of playing. Fairly open, like a volume. He could play, he'd play everywhere. He'd play a tight finger and an open finger. And he'd play good in that. And there'd be a big crowd around at a, a horse show in Innes or anything like that. And lovely. He never played a tune the same, he'd say. But it's always something different. Every time he ever went back to us, it was a different touch. But still, it was the same tune. He just uh, opened the case, uh, took out the pipes, put his foot on the case, and up she goes. That's it then. Now, his, his right leg, of course, was up on the case and it was higher for the case that was just to balance the pipes you know and most pipers have to sit down and would you say this would have influenced his style martin the fact of having had to play standing up yeah i wouldn't no i, I don't think so because he played the same standing up and sitting down you know no his style i'd say came from his father and those in dublin you know who played that particular style at the time the old man's style and Johnny's, I'd say, were were pretty much in common. It, I'd say that anybody would know that uh, it was a handed down tradition from father to son. But I think that J young Johnny was, was, as the father said, a better piper, maybe because he circulated more among musicians. And perhaps travelling maybe was easier in, in that day. Did old John play in the legato or staccato style? Well, old John... As far as I can remember now, looking back over the years, played in, in the legato style. Uh, I'd say the reason for that was that uh, open-fingered piping sounded better for, for street uh, music. I would say that um, it would be heard better to let the sound out rather than stopping it and keeping it, keeping it in. I don't know whether he, he might have uh, been capable of, of staccato playing. He probably was, I'd say. But um, the old man's piping, just the same, was very easy to listen to. And very you certainly would um, sit down and, and enjoy uh, a half a dozen reels. Johnny Doran's repertoire was very much the standard one for traditional players at that time. Reels, he could play any tune. But um, he'd play for what you'd be after, like reels we used to be after there. The cup of tea was a favourite always. Burst House and Connacht. I love it in America. They start amongst them. Green grows away. And they must have tones. Blood and green. And jigs, coppers and brass. You always plan that. Johnny's music gives the impression at times of being played at a bewildering speed. That is so. He plays quicker, we say, than, than usual. Not very much, mind you, though, if you measure it out, though. Uh, there, there is so much being put in, of course, to get that impression anyway. Uh, but it's within his total control all the time. A fault with speed is where the notes begin to be compressed. That never occurs with him, though. So that while you do get that... Uh, feeling of speed you don't get the feeling of it's being too quick for himself it certainly would be too quick for other people to imitate maybe but not in his playing of it 
Felix was better to play for a dance for Sid Danson than Johnny because Johnny said he hated playing for Sid, so he'd have to leave out half of it. So he had all these notes and there's thousands of notes. The the great attraction we say now in Rakish Paddy, the, the thing I like best about it is besides the, the rush of the music is the the sea natural in it. Sea natural now is a a very highly ornamented note on the pipes, you see, and it adds a particular flavour to any tune that occurs in, you see. Now, it, it is the note in Rakish Pante. And the way Johnny plays it, you imagine that the, the thing was actually floating out of the chanter. There's a kind of a, a, an elevation of it, as it were, like each time it comes round, you can hear this kind of thing. And that, for me, is the, the great attraction in this playing. One particular aspect of Johnny's playing which fascinated Shosha Bodley was his playing of the regulators, the part of the Yellen pipes which provides harmonic and rhythmic accompaniment to the melody played on the chanter. How did Johnny's playing compare to that of other masters of this aspect of playing the pipes? The others just, just don't, seem, don't seem to have it, to be quite honest, in anything like that degree at all. As a matter of fact, he had tremendous taste in the regulators. As you know, the harmony in the pipes is sometimes limited. And at that time, most pipers did a, a continual vamp, you know, which always wasn't in tune, as you know. And, and even sometimes when it was, the chord would be in poor taste, you know. But Johnny was very tasty at that, you know. And uh, then he used to play the corner Fraser now. Well, he used to really go to town on that. And he'd, you know, he'd even switch off the drones and stop the regulars of playing that and really roll out a whole lot of chanter playing. I think, whoosh, here comes the whole lot, and he was down on the G chord or something like that. He can emphasize it, you know. Or just, just he really knew how to put over a, a piece. Certainly, there are aspects of his playing, in, in particular I'm thinking of the regulator playing, that are quite different from other pipers, and indeed it, it, it shows the, the big difference there has been since in, in the playing of, of really very famous and very fine pipers, like uh, Ennis and Clancy. Uh, both of those uh, use the regulators for a start far, far less than, than Johnny Dorn does. He keeps them going almost continuously. Not exactly continuously, but close to it. 
And uh, at the same time, what he does is to use this very wide repertoire of rhythms. He's a whole, whole series of different rhythms he uses. And he mixes these all around so that even though the regulators are going all the time, because the rhythm is changing, it never becomes boring. I mean, when Willie Clancy used chords on the regulators, they were just simply very well chosen. They always matched in, they're harmonically right. And they fitted the music beautifully. And then he'd leave long stretches with, without any chordal accompaniment. And so when you do it like that and it's, it's carefully chosen, that's a perfectly legitimate way of doing it. Ennis also uh, didn't use so much. But uh, a piper like Patsy Tui did use a certain amount. He did a fair, a fair amount of uh, regulator playing. Uh, Rousam used them a lot, but without a wide range of, uh, without a wide repertoire of rhythms. So you don't get the enormous variety. And that's really what's so remarkable to me anyway about, about Johnny Dorn. It's just the sheer variety of what he was doing. Johnny Dorn's repertoire included a great deal of the kind of lively dance music which would attract people's attention on the street. But it went beyond that to include more reflective pieces like the traditional song tunes known as slow airs. Yeah, he used to play the Dirage Boy. And uh, that was one now that I remember him playing. Uh, black and the clear air, I think, was another. Uh, you see, slow airs at that time were not as popular. They still haven't, but certainly not as popular as they are now, you know. And uh, he was well able to play slow airs, you know. There was no problem at all to play them. But again, as I say, they hadn't a lot of commercial value or they weren't a great attraction. And what about things that would have commercial value, like any pop songs or, you know, what do you think? Would he play popular songs on the pipes? Well, it, it hadn't hit here at that time, you know, the pop thing. So I can't say I ever had him playing any of those. No, I, no, I didn't. The Slow Air on Chulin, played by Johnny Doran. Brendan Brennach summarised his overall estimate of Johnny Doran's place among pipers. There are people who do it better than he. Now I'm talking of his style of playing. Um, among those, I think there are some present day pipers who might articulate a tune better, but there is, there is a thing that they haven't got though, that there is a, a kind of a life in his music that he is he has some quality of musicianship that puts him far beyond the the tradesman who is able to do the thing absolutely cut and dried according to plan in the early 40s johnny doran's lifestyle of unrestricted travel underwent an unwelcome change he went to dublin during the war because he was having a problem with rations you know rationing and cards stamps for butter and and all that sort of thing, you know. You had to register with a shop. You see, if he had registered with a shop here in Milton, he down at Kilmeda, he'd have to come over for two ounces of tea, you know, at the time, so that wouldn't work. In Dublin, Donald Glennon remembered Johnny Doran's links with a long established club for traditional musicians. We met Johnny in the Pipers Club in Thomas Street, and at that time, the members that come to my mind who were present were Andy Conroy, Mick Conroy, John Kelly, 
I think old John Clark was might have been there, and and uh, Matt Kiernan, I'd say, probably was there as well. Um, and they were always uh, glad when he came. He he didn't come every Saturday night because he might be around, uh, but travelling around the country. But whenever he, he he came, he was more than welcome. We used to do what we called a whip round to make sure that we gave Johnny uh, a, a gratuity for uh, his uh, playing. We all enjoyed listening to Johnny. Paddy McDonough, a fiddle player from Riverstown in County Sligo, recalled a visit by Johnny Dorn when he was able to resume his travels. Johnny Dorn, I heard about in the, to be in the late forties, I'd say, in the at Fear and Colony, and. Uh, to me, he, 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 was the, he was the best piper ever I heard. He had, he had a, the old type of piping. Was he well received at the fair? Uh, <coughs> tremendous. Enthusiasm was unbelievable. That was the first time I, uh, <coughs> that I heard him, but uh, all the old people, such as my father and all the old people that were interested in music and followed it up, they, they left, left the cattle on the streets, left everything there and Listen to Do- to Dorton playing for the for the entire whole afternoon. I think he got. In fact, he got tired. He wasn't able to continue. He got he got fatigued in the finish. In the early winter of 1947, John Kelly, the West Clare fiddle player who lived in Dublin, arranged for Johnny Dorn to be recorded on disc by Kevin Danaher in the premises of the Irish Folklore Commission of St Stephen's Green. He recorded about ten or twelve tunes that night. And he got a pound for his labour, which he thought was great money, and that was out of, out of Kevin's pocket. Money was terribly scarce in those days, you know. And he he didn't play his best that night, I thought. The recording wasn't set up like it's, it is at the present day. But uh, it, it was cut, the wax the disc was cutting around it, with a needle cutting around on a ball of wool. It kind of um, was... It, it, it cut a ball of... We kind of fluff, and Johnny was watching that ball, and he playing, and the ball was getting bigger and bigger as the needle was cutting it. It became as big as the football, and Johnny threw down the pipes. He made one day for that ball. Oh, he said, "I'll bring that up. What will, will, will my wife see it?" Johnny Dorn was obviously fascinated by the technology being employed to record his music, a disc cutting machine which left behind an acetate residue or swarf, which curled into a ball as the recording progressed. Kevin Danaher remembered how Johnny coped with his first experience of being recorded. Didn't worry him in the slightest. Indeed, he thought that was a bit of a joke too. But he was playing for a, an object rather than for people. Yes, as he used to wink at the machine every now and then. You see, yes. And he, the, the, the expression in his face led you to believe that this was fun. He was joking with the pipes, you see, and he was uh, producing all sorts of marvellous results on it. Uh, he was, uh, Dorn was a musical genius, there is no doubt about that. And the sad pity is that much, much more recording wasn't done. We had made an arrangement, a tentative arrangement. The next time you were around, Johnny, as it were, we, we, we'll record again. And he said, oh yes, certainly, certainly, he said. He was delighted to, he, to hear himself playing. And indeed, he, he criticised himself playing. But, um, but he was delighted, he said, and he said, we'll come, we'll come again, he said. We'll do it again. During the particularly harsh winter of 1947, Johnny Dorn was helped to support his family by his many friends in traditional music who found him pieces of work. He worked for a time as bricklayer's assistant to his friend, the Roscommon piper, Andy Conroy. About New Year's Day 1948, Johnny parked his caravan in the shelter of a high wall on a derelict site at Back Lane in the older part of Dublin, opposite Christchurch Cathedral, near where his parents lived at Dial's Cottages in New Street. A general election was pending, 
and Johnny played in the Phoenix Hall at a campaign gathering for Clan na Poblachta, whose leader Sean McBride had heard him play on the street. Johnny was due to play at the party's final rally at College Green on the eve of the election. But four days before that, on Friday, January the 30th, the Dublin newspaper The Evening Mail carried the following report. One man was seriously injured and five members of his family had remarkable escapes in Dublin this morning when portion of a wall collapsed on top of a caravan in which they lived and smashed it. The injured man was John Doran, aged about 40. He had to be dug out from under the wreckage and was removed to the Meath Hospital, suffering from injuries to his back, stomach and head. Mr Doran had his foot on a chair, fastening one of his shoes, and his children were around him, when a sudden gust of wind seemed to hit the wall and four feet up the top of it, collapsed and landed on the top of the caravan roof. The wooden walls and roof splintered up like matchwood, and the six occupants were covered in brick, mortar and flying dust. All that remains of the caravan are the shafts for the horse and part of the flooring. Johnny survived his accident, but from then on he was crippled from the waist down. After some time in the Meath Hospital, he was transferred to St Kevin's Hospital, now known as St James. News gradually filtered through to his friends around the country that Johnny Doran was ill. And we went up to Dublin, Sean Reid and Willie Cassidy and myself. And Leo Rosam, uh, we met him and we went into the hospital, St Kevin's I think, is there an hospital in Dublin? Kevin, it was in Kevin Street anyway. And uh, Johnny of course was lying in the bed and couldn't sit up, you see. So we had pipes and played a few tunes and things like that. And Leo had really gone to town and the colliers, you know, and things like that. Sean Reed, of course, with the uh, mind he had, you see, highly imaginative. You know, the hospital bed is out a bit from the wall. So he stood in behind the bed and blew the pipes and passed the chatter in this way to Johnny, you see. And he stopped it on his chest and he played the colliers. You should have heard that. My God, the way it's a staccato and the whole thing rolled out. It was great. Though Johnny was now unable to walk, he resumed his life as a traveller with his family for a time after leaving St Kevin's Hospital. When he got that really bad, the children was in school. They were put into convent in Dublin. All the girls, you see. She, she wasn't able to cope with him being in the bed and the family. So he had little girls in the convent school in Dublin. I think he was paying for the girls, you know. I don't know whether the boys went to the convent, went into the convent, I can't say, but I know the four girls, what girls he had, went into the convent. <coughs> they were in it till they come up for days, you know. Johnny's love of music never failed as he travelled on with his wife southward through County Kildare, through familiar places inhabited by many of his relatives, including his first cousin, Frank O'Brien. He went around the Curry Camp. I met him at that stage in the Curry Camp, somewhere around the Curry Camp, uh, and... Uh, I remember he played the pipes lying on his back and he also played a whistle that day. Felix was there too. The last time I met him after the accident was in Castle Dermot, County Kildare, Horse Fair. He was then confined to bed. Well, he hadn't changed much that time because it was a short while after the accident, you know. But before he died, he had changed a lot. Got aged, you know, and looked... But his voice was just as good as ever, you know. And he was always comical and, you know, very nice, good humoured. And uh, I hadn't met him then. A short while then, after that, he went to Atai County Hospital. And uh, I went to see him there. It was just 21 months after his accident that Johnny Doran's weakening condition forced his admission into St Vincent's Hospital in Atai County Kildare. Sister Mary Dominic of the Sisters of Mercy, a member of the nursing staff at the time, remembered his arrival. I met him on the 27th of October, 1949, when he was admitted here. He was sent in by the local doctor in Castle Dermot. He suffered from spinal injuries, but um, he was also very, very weak and very ill and needed hospital care. And was he camping in the area at he that time? He was camping in the area at that time. And his, he was living with his wife. Uh, he was so ill that we did not like asking him any questions. 
but he rallied for a long time. Did he ever talk to you about his accident? Not much, not much. It was mentioned at some stage, I'd say the doctor had a report about it, but uh, he never wanted to talk about it. Johnny lingered through the winter of 1949 in St. Vincent's. Before he died, I learned that he was a famous piper from one of his relatives. And I mentioned to Johnny, uh, you never let me know that you were a piper. And he just smiled. But the following Sunday, uh, the pipes were brought in by a relative. And um, we asked Johnny to play. We fixed him up comfortably in the bed so that he would be able to manage the pipes. And he played a couple of tunes, and we were all delighted. The patients that were up gathered around his bedside to hear him, and it was very moving, because everybody knew that he was a dying man. One of his last hospital visitors was Margaret Cash. And he was showing me what was the matter with him. He was telling me that his, he was dead from his chest down. That was the last I had, and I say, Lord, mercy. Johnny Doran died on the 19th of January, 1950. He was very weak all that day and hadn't very much to say to anybody, but um, joined in the prayers and um, I feel he was very dear to God. The death of Johnny Doran cut short in his prime one of the greatest talents in Irish traditional music. On the strength of the 40 odd minutes of recorded music he left behind, his rare gift of creativity and improvisation is compared only to that of the great fiddler Michael Coleman in its freshness and vitality. His playing inspired the generation of musicians who knew him and learned from him directly, among them Willie Clancy, Martin Rochford and so on. In more recent years, his music has become even more influential through his recordings, and a whole popular movement in traditional music acknowledges Johnny Doran as its source and inspiration. The music of Paddy Keenan and the Bothy Band in the 1970s, of Davy Spillane and Boving Hearts in the 1980s, of Fimber Fury and of many others. Music which has resounded around the world all derives its style and nuance from the brilliant playing of a travelling man who played at street corners on fair days for a few pennies thrown into his hat. That program was presented by Jackie Small and produced by Harry Bradshaw. It was first transmitted in March 1988 in the Long Note series. 
The recordings of Johnny Doran's music were reproduced with the permission of the UCD Delarkey Centre for Irish Folklore and the National Folklore Collection.